And what shall we talk about tonight? Yes. Number 23. What is this ocean of endless, incredible beauty which overwhelms and robs one from breath and sense? Hmm. That robs this ocean of endless beauty that robs one of breath and thought. Do not just observe the ocean and its beauty, but dive in it, drown it, and then you experience the beauty more. You become the beauty. What I mean by drowning in it is to drown one's little self the little self of the ego, the small I, that causes all this trouble on dry land. So when the ego self is drowned in that beauty, then the ego self would merge into the beauty and you would go through a period of total forgetfulness of your little self. For then to you, although you function with the little self and do the daily chores, the daily things of life, and yet while functioning in the body, you remain submerged in that beautiful ocean of utter, utter bliss. How do we go about doing this? Well, as we have said before, that this ego self is nothing else but thought formations hmm, that gives you a personality. Hmm, and that is the ego. But you do need a personality to live in this world. How can you live in this world without any personality? So you have a, everyone has a particular kind of personality. But the man who is drowned, submerged in that ocean of beauty, in his personality, he incorporates the personalities of all, all the personalities of the entire world, the entire universe, rocks, flowers, plants, animals, all is absorbed within him, for he is submerged in that ocean of beauty. So his personality is not annihilated, but his personality is expanded, embracing everything that there is. And by embracing all that there is, he experiences the isness of the vast ocean of beauty. So, this cannot come about by just a mental assumption or by intellectual ration, uh, rationalization. Mm. Mentally, you might say, uh, I am my brother's keeper. My brother and I are one. Mm. But with that conscious analysis lurking in the dark shadows of his subconscious mind, you find a separation. You might love your brother very much. You might love someone very much, very dearly. But if something good happens to that brother, are you going to feel elated? Generally, not. 99% of the world's population would not. A 
in him would develop an envy. That why did he win a million dollars in the lottery and not me? But then we would be there. So what is the value of that love? There's no value at all. For in the first place, it was not a love. But if you have assimilated the other person right within yourself, in your heart of hearts, then you would feel elated just by the thought that he has been given a million pounds. It is the same as I have been given a million pounds. So you would wish all the good wishes for him to enjoy what he has gained. Now the million pounds gained by this man. It's no accident. There is no such thing as luck. He has done something to get that. We call it luck. Because on the surface level, uh, he has not worked for it. But yet he got it. So we call it luck. It is no luck. Perhaps he was owed that. Perhaps the doings of his past life hmm, created a credit balance for him and he got it in this life. Hmm? So by having this understanding, we would say that he is deserving of it and who should feel envious of anyone that really deserves it? So, to find that beauty and be submerged in the ocean, envy disappears. Mm -hmm. Wanting to accumulate mm -hmm. is nothing else but building walls around you, building a wall so high that you cannot see never mind being submerged in the ocean of beauty, but you cannot even see the ocean. Hmm? And that is produced by greed, by accumulation. Hmm? And what do you accumulate? You accumulate possessions, material possessions, which are none other than an illusion. Hmm? A man can only eat one meal at a time. You can only sleep in one bed at a time. Hmm? And he can only drive one car at a time, although he might have a dozen cars. Hmm? So that, those are his necessities. Hmm? But people do not think in that fashion, that let me just have my necessities, in order to keep alive, to keep this body going, or to do the work I have to do. Hmm? They feel that by having a bank balance of millions or whatever wealth and possessions, they feel that that will give me security. But it is not so. Hmm? It does not give you security, those thoughts of accumulation which is accompanied by greed, hmm? could never give you security. Hmm? The most insecure people I've met in this world have been multimillionaires. Hmm? First, they work hard to make the millions, and they work harder still to look after the millions. Hmm? You see the vicious circle. And yet there's nothing wrong in having something. Hmm? Nothing wrong in having, possessing an umbrella on a rainy day like this. Why must you get wet when an umbrella is available? But then, there comes the question again of attachment. How 
much am I attached to worldly possession. And if we don't get rid of the idea of greed and accumulation, we will always be attached. Hmm? As I said, you can only eat one meal at a time and drive one car at a time. And after all, what is the difference between a small mini Volkswagen or a Rolls Royce? They both take you from point A to B. That is the purpose of a car. We can go with the Volkswagen or with the Rolls Royce. You still reach where you want to reach. Hmm? But having the Rolls Royce, you are building up your ego. It's a status symbol. Hmm? When you drive down the road, you say, There goes Mr. Rockefeller. Hmm? And you salute him. Because why do you salute him? Why do you salute that rich man? Hmm? Because it is an inner desire of yours, a subconscious desire to have what he has. Hmm? So both are in trouble, the poor man and the rich man. One wants to accumulate and has the greed and the yearning for it, and the other has the possessions hmm? and so attached to it that in both the people, the poor and the rich, they are ego bound. They have the sense of I, I, I. Hmm? As I said, you sleep in one bed at a time. Reminds me of a story of a Jewish man. This Jewish man um, was talking to a very intimate friend of his. He says, I like to sleep alone. Hmm? So the friend asked, what about your wife? He says, oh, since we were married, we slept in separate bedrooms. Hmm? So this friend, being an intimate friend, they friends discuss anything when they're very intimate. He says, but what happens during the night? You feel like a bit of cuddling. Hmm? Then what do you do? He says, then I whistle. My wife comes to my room. This friend was very astounded by this. But then he asks this man, he says, what would happen if your wife feels like a bit of a cuddle? Then what? So this man explains, she comes to my door and taps and says, Ike, did you whistle? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, life is so, so funny. Life is so funny. Even man and wife live in separate bedrooms. Your small eye and the real eye within you live in separate bedrooms. Aren't you closely married in oneness with the real self within you? Why must you put the little eye into a separate bedroom? Hmm? Yes, sir. So, all these qualities of accumulation, etc., etc., build that wall around you so you cannot see the vastness, the beauty of the ocean. And yet, being behind this high wall, you can still smell the ocean. Is, would that not be proof enough that behind this wall there is an ocean? Because you get the smell of the salty ocean. 
If that is not enough to make you break down the wall that separates you from the ocean, then how can you enjoy the beauty of the ocean? How can you swim in the ocean? So, the main principle is this, that we have to expand the ego. You could never annihilate the ego. For annihilation of the ego will make you totally insensible because in the ego self is contained thought, because it is made of thought, it contains rationalization. The left hemisphere of the brain is working. You need that. Otherwise, you could never live a worldly life. You can never be in the world and yet not of the world. And that is one of the bases of our teachings. So, to find greater clarity and take off those dark glasses to see the world as it really is, one has to expand the ego and embrace it. Many philosophies talk of sublimating the ego. You cannot do it. You cannot sublimate the ego. You can only clarify the ego by getting rid of greed, hate, avarice, covetousness, and the idea of sacrifice. And more than that, the inner feeling that this little outer me is not the real me, for there is no me and there is no mine. It is all but one. And once that idea is firmly established within oneself, then you enjoy the beauty of the ocean. Then you dive deep into the ocean and not only experience the surface waves that are rising high and low, but deeper down, the beautiful calm. So it becomes one existence, but also at the same time a coexistence between materiality and spirituality. For both could be well blended and you find the sweetness. Like tea. I just had a cup now. You put in a teaspoon of sugar, and the sugar dissolves. You do not see the sugar. But the tea becomes sweet. Without the sugar, the tea is bitter. And the bitter tea is that little ego self. So by adding that one teaspoon of divinity, dissolving it within the ego, and the ego being dissolved in the higher self of us, we live a life of total combination of fullness, and of fulfillment. I said many times in some talks that man is already fulfilled. As a matter of fact, his cup is running, his cup flows over. But we put a lid on it, the lid of the ego self. So when these qualities of avarice, greed, covetousness, envy, hatred, when these qualities are removed, you can't remain a vacuum. Something gets filled 
into you. What is that something? Love. Hmm? Love, where you could view the saint and the sinner with an equal eye, hmm? with one eye. It is the most glorious, the most beautiful, the most beauteous experience any man can have. And this can be done very easily by bringing ourselves to a state of integration. It is only the integrated man that could really love from within himself. I'm incorporating in his question the question you asked the other day, which we postponed. Hmm? So it is the only, uh, Charlie, you remember. So it is only the integrated man that could really experience love. For his love is all encompassing. Yeah? Yet one thing happened. I was telling someone last night that in this worldly life that we live, even the self-realized man requires a point of devotion. Yeah. Ramakrishna had Kali, the goddess Kali, as his point of devotion. Yeah. Vivekananda had Margaret Noble, who was known as Sister Navdita, as his point of devotion. Yeah. Krishna had his Radha as his point of devotion, who was really another man's wife. But the love was so pure that it was not adulterous. So, the mechanics are these, that through that one point of devotion, you extend through that channel your love to the entire universe. Yes, and that devotion could assume many forms. Hmm? It could be your mother, your father. It must be total, in the sense of total non-attachment. For then only devotion works. For if there is attachment, then that devotion is only on the surface level and not welling up from the depth of the ocean of beauty. So, your point of devotion could be your mother, your father, your beloved, your lover, your guru, anything. This flower, anything. So that is where we start. And a sense of sacrifice begins. What are you really sacrificing? in that devotion that you have for another. You are sacrificing your ego self and sacrificing the littleness of it so that it could become big, it could expand, it could become more clear. Now do not make a mistake in thinking that you must have a bigger ego no, there's a difference between a big ego and an expanded ego. A clear ego, so expanded that the entire universe is there in your arms. Yeah. And that is the beauty. And everyone has the right, everyone has it inbuilt in him. You know my story of the soft drink can, so I won't repeat it. All of you have heard it. So everything is involved, you see. But to people, life just becomes a business. 
the business of living, um, profiting, making a profit. The real profit is to swim, dive deep down in that ocean of bliss and love, not the profit that we go and put in the bank. An Irish schoolmaster, do you have Irish people here? Hmm? Good. So an Irish schoolmaster, hmm? or of Irish origin rather, hmm? so this Irish schoolmaster um, asked his class a question and offered a prize. He said, he asked, who are the three greatest men that lived in the world? So one boy got up and he said, Christopher Columbus. Another boy got up and said, um, George Washington. So then a little Jewish boy shouted out, This was in Ireland. Little Jewish boys shouted out, Saint Patrick. And the schoolmaster gave this Jewish boy the prize. So afterwards the schoolmaster asks this boy, he says, what made you say Saint Patrick? So this boy replies, he says, in my heart I knew that one of the greatest men that lived was Moses. But business is business. <laughs> so we try to gain. The boy wanted the prize, and he knew when he was he was in Ireland, and his schoolmaster was Irish, so he would say something that would please the schoolmaster, and he got the prize. You see the scheming. And this is done by all. They scheme and scheme and scheme to win the prize hmm, of wealth or name or fame. But how long does it last? Hmm? You shed this body, you've shed everything. Hmm? Take it this way. Say, for example, an international personality might be known by hundreds of thousands of people. Hmm? Take the ordinary man. How many people does he really know? Maybe he's involved in some society. Hmm? He might know four or five hundred people. Hmm? Just knowing them. How many people does he really know or are intimate with? Perhaps 10 or 12. Hmm? That's all. That's the average. Hmm? So, he tries to have symbol statuses. Beautiful, Rolls Royce, swimming pool, you know, mansion-like house. Who is he showing off to those 10 or 12 people? Hmm? For thousand million people living in this world, they don't even know that you exist. They don't know you exist. Only those few that know you know that, ah, there is Tom and there is Jack and there is John and there is Mary and there is... You see, the whole falsity of it, that the entire structure is built without any foundation whatsoever. The lady goes into a shop, and I was in that shop. This happened about 25, 27 years ago. And this lady comes into the shop. I went those years, I used to, when I came to South Africa, I started life as an accountant, means I was trained as an accountant. And of course I had to go and see this client of mine, and I was in his shop. 
For that time in South Africa, we never had rons and cents. We had pounds, shillings, and pence. So this woman comes in and asks, she says, have you got any perfumes? So the shopkeeper brought out a bottle of perfume, three and sixpence. So this lady says, haven't you got something more expensive than this? She says, yes, ma'am, I'll get it for you. She goes to the back, brings the same perfume in a differently shaped bottle, and said, Madam, this is a little more expensive. It's two pounds, three shillings and sixpence. And she bought it. Same perfume in a different bottle. Why did she buy that? Hmm? The three and sixpenny perfume. In any case, you don't need perfume. Natural smells are far better than perfumes. Hmm? Right. Uh, if I sleep next to my wife and if she's smelling of perfume, no, I want to smell her, feel her, be together with her, merge into that oneness. Hmm? Yes. But because she thought that I will smell better with a more expensive perfume, so she spent two pounds more and she got the same stuff. And that is what happens in everyday living. It happens with everyone. You pay more because you find that you are going to be better. Hmm? I'm never critical of anyone, but cosmetics, for example, seeing we're talking of perfumes, that is a multi-billion dollar industry today, catering to people's vanity. Hmm. In India, especially the villages, India is composed of 20% cities and 80% villages. The people, the peasants, are so simple. Hmm? You look at their skins, they are so soft. So clear, so beautiful. Hmm? What do we do here in the West? Hmm? By all the most expensive kinds of powders and rouges and creams, hmm? all those chemicals, they spoil our skin. Hmm? It does. So what you have to do is buy more and more of those cosmetics to look nice to cover up the damage that has been done by the chemicals, and more damage gets done. Hmm? And this is what? Vanity. And where does vanity come from? From the ego that stops you from swimming in the vast ocean of beauty. Hmm? Shampoos. People buy the most expensive kind of shampoos. Hmm? If you hear the name of uh, Pierre Cardin, uh, mention a couple of the names the ladies would know, all those big French names. Hmm? Fine. It's worthless, but because of the name, you pay a fortune for it. Hmm? All those various shampoos. In India, in the villages, do you know how women wash their hair? They go to the river and get mud, a very dark mud. They rub their head with the mud and then, of course, wash it off. And their hair is like silk. It costs nothing. Silk. Shine, bright, this luster. Do you see the false, what I'm trying to point out? And this applies to men as well. I'm sorry if I'm just taking examples from women, but I could give you another hundred examples of men. Hmm? Vanity. So, now in this talk, I've been pointing out 
all the various things that build up our ego. In other words, we are nothing else but show-offs. And who are we showing off to? Is the 10 or 12 people that know us personally. And because of that, the primal quality that is already in us, simplicity, that is lost. And life becomes complex. And then you say, oh, all these troubles on my head. We have created the troubles. We have created the complexities of life. And we call ourselves highly intellectual people, highly thinking people. We've got brains. Yes, so this Canadian man meets a Jew and uh, he's chatting to the Jew. And he says, you know, you fellows are real cute. You make a lot of money. Hmm? Could you tell me the secret of it? Hmm? I'm just a poor Canadian and I'd also like to be rich like you. So the Jew says, you know, we Jews eat a lot of fish. And fish gives us brains. It's a brain food. Hmm? So when the brain works well, you can make a lot of money. So this young man asks, uh, can you get me some fish? Is it a special kind of fish? So the Jewish man says, yes, I can send you some fish. Hmm? Give me $20, I'll send you the fish. So a little... A few days later, a box was delivered to this young man's house. And when he opened the box, there were three small fishes in there. Twenty bucks. So, sometime later, he met this Jewish man again. And he says, thank you very much for the fish. But three small fishes for twenty dollars? Isn't that too much? So the Jew replies, Ah, you see, it has started working. Your brain has started working. (laughs) 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 If our brains can only start working in a direction that could lead us to that infinite ocean of divinity. I see a little child cry, tears rolling down the cheeks. To me, that very drop of tears is the entire ocean, the entire universe. Have you watched a child really crying? Have you watched the expression on the child's face, that innocence, that beauty. So man seeks always for outer beauty. Hmm? Outer beauty. Nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. But he does not seem to realize that finding the inner beauty it will enhance our perception of the outer beauty. And everything would become more beautiful. Hmm? Uh, you, all of you might have read a little biographical sketch about me. Um, but to repeat something from it, when I was 15 years old, that was the first time I entered into the state of nirvikalpa samadhi, merging in that ocean of beauty. I was away for two hours, but when I came out of the meditation, it seemed like two minutes I'd just gone in and out. But two hours at last. When I opened my eyes, everything seemed so much more beautiful. 
and everything covered in gold, a golden haze that still persists with me right up to now. Now, 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 it's just gold, gold, gold all around me. Does that not make things more beautiful for me? Is it not worth living then as a householder instead of as a monk or an ascetic? Experience the joy inside and bring it to a conscious, perceptive level, and the whole value of life is changed. And when you are established within yourself, then the actions you perform will be right actions. You can have millions in the bank, you can have mansions, you can have all your expensive motor cars and yachts. Enjoy them. Why not? You have brains, like in the story of the Jew. Hmm? We've made twenty dollars with three little fishes. Hmm? Enjoy it all, enjoy it all. But at the same time, when you look at the car, or the mansion, or the beautiful antique furniture in your houses, hmm? Just have that in mind when you're truly established within yourself. Then you will always have it in your mind that this is the beauty of God. This is the beauty of God. For divinity expresses itself in a myriad forms, in every form. There is divinity. Hmm? Hmm? This world is like the car. Hmm? It has all the mechanisms in it, the gears and the brakes and the engine and the pistons and the carburetor and what have you. Yet the car won't go without the gas. Hmm? Divinity is the gas that makes the car go. And divinity at the same time has given you the free will hmm, to take the car wherever you want to take it. You can drive to Seattle or you can drive to Vancouver. Free will he has given you and yet at the same time he empowers you to drive in spite of your free will. You can't lift a hand without that energy. Hmm? The car won't run without that energy of the gas. Hmm? So all is energy. All is energy. Hmm? So enjoy it. But remember that all the material things are composed of the energy for matter and energy are not two things apart. It's the same thing. Fine energy that becomes more and more condensed hmm, becomes matter. Hmm? Like the old example I give, um, water vapor is very fine. You can hardly see it. That could be condensed into water, liquid, and the very liquid can be put into the freezer and made into a block of ice. Yet the underlying principle between the vapor, the gaseous matter, and the water and the block of ice, still all has the same principle, H2O. Oh? <laughs> yes. So we got to break down the barriers by expansion of the ego. And when we break down the barriers, then the ego itself merges away into that divinity, into that vast ocean of beauty. And when you dive into that vast ocean of beauty, 
you come out being beauty yourself. For now you have experienced it. You have embraced it. And you and the ocean are but one. Your mind is flooded with that joy. Your heart is opened with that love. Your brain sends out signals to the environment, making the environment love you. For there is one great truth. If you take one step towards divinity, divinity takes ten steps towards you. If you give one cent, ten cents come back. That's an infallible law. It comes back to you in some form or the other. The giver is always the gainer. You haven't got that one poem of mine, have you? Uh, life is made to give. Uh, would it take you long? No. No, fine. Let's see if we can find another joke here. Mm. Ah, there were these three admirals on this big, the biggest battleship, one of the biggest battleships. And the three admirals, one was a German, one was a Russian, and one was a Canadian. So while they were chatting, the Russian admiral steps forth. He says, Russia as the greatest navy in the world. And we have, we're talking about courage, that we got to have the courage to expand the ego. Hmm? The Russia is the greatest navy in the world. And also our sailors are the bravest men. So he shouts, Ivan Ivanovich, Come here. So Ivan Ivanovich came there and he saluted. And he says, you climb right on top of that mast and you dive down into the sea and swim around the ship and come back and report to me. So Ivan Ivanovich climbed up the mast dived down, swam around this large ship, one of the biggest, and reported back. So he says, you see how wonderful our sailors are, brave, they got courage. Hmm? So the German said, well, I must show something. So he calls one of his sailors, hmm? Jurgens. So he tells, he says, Jurgens, you climb up that mast and jump down and swim three times around the ship and report back. So Jurgens did that. Now the admiral, the Canadian admiral, he would not be let down. You know, we Canadians are brave people. So he calls his man, hmm? Dickinson. Dickinson. Dickinson comes, he says, hi, Ad. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> not, not, yes, sir. Uh, hello, Admiral. Hi, Ad. So he says, Dickinson, you shin up to the mast. And from there you dive down and swim seven times around this ship and come back and report. So Dickinson says, I must climb up that mast and swim seven times around this large ship and come back and report to you? He says, Ad, you must be balmy. <laughs> Why didn't you bloody hell do it yourself? 
So then the Canadian Admiral says, you see, here is an example of supreme courage. <laughs> <laughs> well, who would speak to an admiral like that? Eh? That's supreme courage. Hmm. Let me recite a poem to you. The next time you you have a tape, you know, perhaps some of our meditators would like. We're talking about giving. Hmm. Let my love be measured by giving and not by gain. For if gain I sought, this life lived would be in vain. Love then yourself to lose, I say, again and again, for the giver can only give as clouds disperse in rain. Filled and full as a teardrop on maiden cheek without stain, for heaving breasts heave, but to give all all to her swain. The blushing bride can blush no more. Wheat becomes flowered grain. Sweetness of the sugar comes from crushed giving of the cane. Let my love be measured by giving and not by gain. For flowers too the fragrance give let me sing forever in this is pain. Yeah. That is the meaning and purpose of life. Yeah, as in the sperm of mine. It is the crushing of the cane where it gives off its sweetness. It is the crushing of the wheat that gives us the grain so that we eat bread. That is sacrifice. So, as we go through this life and we do our meditations and spiritual practices regularly, then these qualities will come unto the If you say to yourself a million times a day that I love, I love, I love, I love, I love, it won't work. Hmm? If there's dirty water in a jar, hmm? you do not, you cannot empty the jar, using it as an analogy, of course. But just put that jar under a faucet and let water run. Automatically, the dirty water will be replaced by clean water. Hmm? So. so, you say you want to love the entire universe. You want to swim in this ocean of beauty. The only way to do this is the expansion of the ego by getting rid of the things we have talked about this evening. But for that, you need courage and you need strength and spiritual practices and meditation gives you the strength to rid yourself to rid your jar of the dirty water and be filled with the clean water, fresh water of love. So swim, dive in, it's fine. I guarantee that. And I will, and I will always be there in my little rowboat watching you in case you drown, I'll pull you out. But don't be afraid. Leap. Huh? Leap. Now, see what we got here. Um, a father had a son who qualified as a lawyer. And one day, 
He said, let me catch him out hmm? on a legal point. So the clock had just struck one. So he asks his lawyer son, he says, if I smash this clock, would I be arrested for killing time? Hmm? So this, the lawyer's son says, no, you won't be arrested. It will be self-defense because the clock struck first. <laughs> you know, one day, the chap came to me and he was given the task of being one of the after-dinner speakers. So, when he comes to me, he says, Guruji, you know, you've given about 3,000 satsangs and this, that, and, you know, you've spoken, spoken, spoken so much, so give me a few tips, because it's the first time I would have to get up and speak. And he was feeling very nervous. So, give me some tips. So I told him, I says, when you get up to for the after dinner speech. When you get up to speak, and in 10 minutes, if you don't strike oil, then stop boring. <laughs> yeah, think about it, think about it. The penny will drop. <laughs> yes, and then um, this talking of speakers, this one speaker in his speech was blood and thunder. Let us get rid of all the isms. Let's get rid of capitalism and communism and colonialism and all the isms we must get rid of. So there was an old lady sitting behind in the room and she shouted out, how about also adding in rheumatism? <laughs> well, it's been a lovely evening.